Welcome to the Bombay Bar podcast, a show where we share rich history of the Bombay Bar Association through our esteemed members, past and present. On today's episode, we have with us Justice Shavak Vazirdar. He retired as 33rd Chief Justice of the Punjab and Haryana High Court. On the day of his retirement, social media was flooded with outpouring of affection displayed by the bar and the staff. On this episode, we will explore the additional roles judges have beyond listening to cases, passing orders and judgments. He will also help us understand the human touch needed when working within the judicial system. Well, now that uh, it's no more a court appearance, do I take the liberty of calling you Shavaks? You can call me anything. Thank you. And I've retired. Thank so. you for that. I know your father was an engineer. He was working with cement factories all over the country, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Meghalaya. He even went to Africa, Tanzania, Kenya. So how it is to be a child moving with parents in that kind of uh, atmosphere? My parents lived in very, very small places, not even in villages. It was only uh, the cement factory colonies. So I left home when I think, when I was about six years old. Oh, oh. Hmm. I came to Bombay for a couple of years and then I think my parents had a slightly different approach to life. So they sent me to Rishi Valley School, mm -hmm. which is down south. Rishi Valley also was a very rural background. The nearest, uh, the nearest town was 10 miles away, Madanapalli. And we were just surrounded by hills, by paddy fields, groundnut fields, sugarcane fields, mango groves. We had our own dairy. It was a very happy childhood. There is always a little bit of pressure, but not the kind that I've seen in the city. I believe you picked up a fair bit of Sanskrit also in the process. No, no, no. <laughs> just a few shlokas, etc. <laughs> but, you know, with a childhood in different places, we picked up a few more languages than you would in one place. Like, for instance, I speak English, Hindi, Gujarati, and, uh, well, I would like to say Tamil, but as one of my classmates who I'm in touch with, we are in touch with each other all the time. He always says that people who know Tamil know that Shabaks doesn't know Tamil, but people who don't know Tamil thinks he speaks very good Tamil. <laughs> <laughs> but I can be yeah. understood and I can understand. It's a, it's a good yeah. feeling to know. So oh, yes. Languages. It's very useful. I found it useful in court. When I remember in the Supreme Court, I was appearing with uh, Mr. Venugopal and Soli Surabji was against us. And I wanted to tell Venugopal something which I didn't want Mr. Surabji to hear. So my instructing advocate, Manik Karanjawal, I remember that, she said, tell him in Tamil. Huh. So I told him in Tamil. <laughs> he must be surprised that you were talking to him. Yeah, when Justice Radhakrishnan and I were on the bench hmm. in the Bombay High Court, I believe that some people at the bar used to call it the... South Indian bench, but uh, it was a small courtroom next to the Chief Justice's courtroom and we didn't want Mr. Chagla and Mr. Dwarkadas and Mr. Chino and Mr. Sirva and everybody to un hear what we were saying. So we spoke in Tamil. And uh, we hear a little bit about your interest, keen interest in debating rather. How, how did that come about? I was the worst chemistry student in class, but the chemistry teacher was my best friend. Mm -hmm. And he was coaching me in elocution, in taking uh, current affairs debates and in debating. And uh, one of the, the other teacher told him that, look, what are you doing? Shavaks is doing extremely badly in my subject. So he said he's doing worse in my subject, but he's doing well in this. So let's encourage him. Yes. And that continued in college. It had to try for the team, got into the team. And How did you then uh, think of coming into the legal side, the law. While debating, I met so many people. Doctors, architects, but mainly lawyers. Mm -hmm. I remember I met uh, Rajni Ayer, our dear friend, Aspi Chinoy, Navroz Sirvai, Raju Subramaniam, all in, uh, in the course of our debating and elocution competitions. Rajni represented the university, Aspi represented... Uh, Government law, Navroz represented Elphinstone, I represented Xavier's. And 
we just became friends over the years and then each of them sort of guided me because they all knew <coughs> the profession. Of course, I don't think Aspi did. He was a total self-made from the beginning. But you, know, you take advice from all your friends and go ahead. Well, I must tell you that I share the advantage of being in the same chamber where Justice Vazirdar came up. So tell us, how did you join the chambers and how did it work for you? My principal in Xavier's, because of the debating, I knew him and he, when I told him this, he took me to a firm, Smith & Byrne, Lambert & Dubash. It was a small firm for a little while. I went there. And then when you're in a firm, you meet others. And then Rajni took me to her brother, Ravi Krishnamurti, and Aspi, of course, also threw in his ideas. And Navroz did too, I remember, for that. And ultimately, I joined uh, Mullah and Mullah with Mr. E.B. Desai and uh, Marizban Bharucha. Uh -huh. So I joined them for a while and then decided to join council practice. At which stage, once again, it was Marizban and Aspi and Rajni, you know, who recommended that knowing the uh, two of us that I would be best suited to be in Rohit's chambers, Rohit Kaparia's chambers. Well, I must share that, that uh, I joined uh, same chambers as you know, but the first ever I met him was before joining him, I was arguing a matter and he was opposing me. Oh, really? I lost I it. Know. And when we came out, he encouraged me by saying that you did the best that you could. Ah. So that's what seniors are like. There are always people who help you without showing that they are really helping. Like take it, for instance, Rohit. You could never overtly see that he was helping, but you know that, you know, being with him, hmm. at times you got briefed with him. And then once you are in a solicitor's firm, you go to court, you meet so many people, you interact with them. Yes. And then work comes along. I've just learned that uh, very early in your days as a lawyer, you got a chance to work a bit closely with Mr. H.M. Sirwai, the constitutional expert, our AG for attorney, Advocate General for about two decades, a great personality. So how did you get that opportunity? Sirvai had had a cataract operation and he couldn't read. And he was working on his book. So he wanted notes to be made. And since he couldn't read, he requested me to go to him every morning, read the latest AIR reports and he would dictate notes, which I would write down. And, uh, oh, it was a phenomenal experience. It was really something else. To my mind, of, of course, you'll always have people with different views as to who is the greatest. To my mind, I think he was the greatest ever. Okay. And it's difficult to get another Sirvai. But, yeah, it was fascinating. I mean, for instance, his memory. It was amazing. I remember when I read one judgment, he said, they must have, refer every time he would say, they must have referred to this judgment. And it was always there. Yes. On one occasion when it wasn't there, he was, he looked a little puzzled. He said, it's not possible that they haven't referred to this judgment. I said, well, it's not there. He said, go to the body of the judgment. It wasn't there. Then he said, ah, but they've referred to this judgment, which has referred to this judgment. Ah, so indirectly. And he told me on which page number in his book he had dealt with it. And his book is in three volumes. Yes. So, well, uh, you had good two decades as a lawyer. And then um, one fine day we just learned. <laughs> I did not have any background for sure, I'm telling you. Yeah. That like uh, we are going to part ways. So how did this thing about accepting judgeship work for you? It was very difficult. The first time around, I just wasn't prepared and I couldn't accept it. So, and I told the person who asked me if I was interested that it would not be possible right now. And the second time around, I was still not ready, but I accepted it because I always was fascinated by the job. Mm -hmm. Not easy, very difficult. Uh, especially finance, you have, I had financial constraints, but uh, I had the support of my mother. That's the only reason I could accept it. Just if Vazirdar was being sworn in as a judge, I was in courtroom 46 and uh, sitting next to me was Rohington Nariman at that time, a lawyer, good friend of uh, Shavak's. And after the oath, he told, 
uh, I wish Zal, that is Justice Vazidah's father was here. I wish Zal was here. How moved he would be. Oh, my father would have been very happy, of course. But the only consolation is that he knew it had been offered. Uh-huh. Yes. At that time, he was very keen that I should take it, but I told him it, it was not possible then. So at least he knew. By the time I it was offered again and I accepted it, I he was no more there. Of course, there are you, you have to think a lot about it. But really, it's more from the financial point of view. It was, as I said, if it wasn't for my mother's support, I would not have accepted it. I didn't. Yes. I, w- I couldn't afford it. No, truly speaking, it's service to the society, yes. And no, I don't make, agree at all. Uh, you make I'll huge, stop you there. Uh, no. <laughs> you make huge uh, financial sacrifice. No, but that's the biggest amount of rubbish I've ever heard. Uh-huh. When people say, oh, you, you, uh, they sacrifice so much by becoming judge. Nobody sacrifices anything by accepting judgeship. Financial for sure. Is that the only thing? I agree, that yeah. I agree. No, I don't agree at all. I mean, people <laughs> say this, I think, just to make us feel good. Uh-huh. I do not know of a single person who has accepted judgeship by sacrificing anything. You choose one against the other. That's all. So where is the question of sacrifice? You're right in a basket. You pick up what you like. You right? do what you uh, want to. Uh, Nobody's forced you to become a judge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I liked it. Mm. I remember distinctly. Uh, shortly after you became a judge, and you were sitting in the bench with Justice A.P. Shah. We made fun of both of you that you went to clean the chapati in Mumbai. How was it <laughs> for you? No, I think it was literally on the 13th day of my judgeship that, uh, you know, we there was some petition about the Bhelpuri uh, vendors and the snacks vendors at the chapati beach. And that, of course, was A.P. Shah's very... A very robust judge, you know, always willing to try out something new. It was all credit to him. But uh, yes, we our photograph was on the newspaper <laughs> with the <laughs> caption "Anticipatory Bail." <laughs> so. uh, well, all judges uh, are polite and nice. I'm not making any negative comment here. But uh, in your case, it was said by all the juniors, particularly that it is impossible to see this judge getting angry or annoyed or losing his school. How did you manage that? You realize that everybody's abilities are different. Yes. So you hope that your experience or your knowledge can help a person overcome it. And, you know, you're, I'm not saying this to be polite. And I mean it. You take some of the juniors. You give them a chance to argue. They will do as good, if not a better job. Okay. The thinking, the experience will always help, you know, uh, develop a new point, which a youngster may not think of. But once the point is there, their ability to put it across their ability to assist the court is really very good. It is, and if you are willing to listen to him, he's as good as the senior who will be lead, who would be leading him. Right. The only thing is, then you have to develop techniques of how to bring them out of their shell because everybody is not brave, everybody is not forceful. Yes. Everybody has his different ways. So if somebody is quiet, if somebody, I mean. We recognize that there are some people who were nervous. So you have to develop techniques of bringing that, making him comfortable. Sort of giving him or her an encouragement to uh, take it a little further, to course, communicate that yeah. point. I, just one technique I'll give you. For instance, I always found it very useful. Oh. Was when you saw a person sort of stuttering a bit because of a person being nervous, but you knew he was prepared. Ask him to open to a particular page and start reading. So the flow comes. The flow comes, huh. that tension, that nervousness goes out and then you see the difference. It's just one of the techniques. There are so many which we yes. try, which we discuss in chambers ju- yes. as judges. And yes. this is just one of them which I can tell you we found very useful. Okay, talking a little bit about uh, our High Court, Bombay High Court. We have a... Uh, full-fledged museum now, fully housed museum with all the artifacts. 
but the first glimpses of that museum or a trailer of that museum if i say so i found it in your chambers <laughs> and uh, when we talked you said how it was brought about please share something about that yes i was fascinated by the building and you know being a judge you have access to every part of it at any time even on saturday sundays i used to go with my children it's a treasure trove that place there's all kinds of carvings all over the place and then when i went to places which we don't even know exist you know the which we rather we've never been to like the commissioner for taking accounts i found chairs and tables which were mind boggling with rosewood inlay so i was known as the scavenger among my <laughs> colleagues i pick up furniture from everywhere mm. have it done up and the staff was so thrilled with it that every time they found something was being thrown out or discarded they would bring it to my chambers and we started developing that chamber and i thought the best way to do it was only to use the high court things to keep the integrity of the building so we had old photographs of the flooring as it used to be replicated that and yeah the whole chamber was built over the years by picking up things from here there everywhere including a wash basin oh 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 a canteen uh huh and then fortunately the museum was there before i left so a lot of it the clocks there was a french royal exchange there was a fabre louba long clock everything went there so most of it was actually not in use at some point of time in between no it is not not in use it was in use mm -hmm. but in different places so i just thought it would be mm -hmm. nice that people can see it and of course uh, i really must mention that one of the persons who's really helped preserve the heritage in that building is rajan jaikar mm -hmm. i mean i don't want to go into the details of what he's done but he is one of the reasons our building you know a lot of that is preserved well is because of him because he is passionate about it he is knowledgeable about it far more than any of us yes he has done a lot of hard work at that time fantastic and no then... no not just hard work he's done a very courageous job also i mean he and there's another architect there was she's no more unfortunately sharda vivedi mm -hmm. they never hesitated in telling us that look just as was if the you're a lawyer when we need legal advice we'll come to you mm. but when it comes to heritage architecture you come to us for advice <laughs> she never felt embarrassed and she uh, told us off mm, that look what uh, you're doing here is wrong yes she was right uh, yes it's their subject they <laughs> yeah. know it best so once you accept that then no doubt from a layman's point of view a judge is as good as the other any judge is the same but you have division benches you sometimes have full courts which means more than two judges we have now supreme court sitting in constitution benches five judges seven judges so can you give us some insight as to how does this whole system work and what is this thing about division bench i'll give you an example two examples in fact i was the senior judge in aurangabad on the division bench it was a very important case i think it was an election matter i think so and my colleague was actually very senior in the he had, was he had, was in the district uh, he was a district judge earlier and then he became a judge so it's just actually he was much senior to me i was only senior in the high court i knew that he was uncomfortable with the view that i was taking i just nudged him pushed him a little bit insisted that he writes his own judgment i didn't agree with his view he didn't agree with mine so the matter went to the third judge the third judge agreed with him so be it right exactly yes. so that's when i went back to him and told him i said it's so important that you should decide on your own never worry about that there's nothing like a senior judge junior judge over here i have taken a different view when i was a junior judge yes but even more important is this example i remember i hadn't done much tax you had i hadn't done much tax and when i first sat on a tax assignment <clears throat> the chief justice of course naturally put the second judge who knew tax manoj justice manoj sanklecha i still call him my guruji because <laughs> he is the one who helped me a lot in that and 
there was one matter which is important, short point, but important. And I wrote the judgment. He didn't agree. So we were discussing it over days. And I told him, I said, look, at some stage, we have to deliver the judgment. If you take a different view, write the judgment. Ultimately, I told him, I said, look, the best, when you're, when you're discussing it, you, go in, you tend to go in circles. I said, you write your judgment, just as I've written mine. Hmm. So he wrote his judgment. Mm -hmm. One sentence over there, when I read it, one sentence sort of, you know, looked a little different. I mean, I couldn't follow it. So I asked him. It was an important principle in tax law that I didn't know. The moment he explained it to me, I realized where I had gone wrong. So I tore up my judgment and he delivered the judgment. But what happened later is interesting. Uh, you know, we have chamber matters, which we hear in chambers. So for some reason or the other, maybe for, you know, modification or rectification, the lawyers came uh, to my chambers for something. And I asked them, I said, what happened to that matter in appeal? They said, no, we decided not to go in appeal. I mm -hmm. said, why? He said, see, the judgment was, we thought the judgment was perfect and it, thought it should rest there. Oh, that way. Yes. So just see, uh. if you have this problem that, oh, I, you know, should you... You shouldn't dissent, etc. Look at what would have happened. And here, Justice Manoj Sanklecha corrected me. And everybody said that was a perfect judgment. And we would both have looked foolish had it gone my way, the way I did it. Yes, no <laughs> doubt. Right? Well, that's a beautiful insight. Yeah. And a very simple. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and it is so nice to sit with a colleague and uh. exchange views. And no matter what you people think, the strongest judge is always happy to have an interaction. I don't want to name names because people misunderstand them. When you want to interact, they guide you well. You learn a lot from them. So, so there is a lot of value when we say this matter or this appeal or these kind of matters would go to a division. Of course, bench. it should be. And then came a day when you had to move into Chandigarh, right? Uh, going as acting chief and then also being chief for a long time. So was it a tough decision to move out of Mumbai or you were ready to leave at any time? Peculiar as it may sound, yes, it was a very difficult decision. I had to agonize a lot about it because of my personal uh, constraints. For instance, I didn't have a house. My mother had a house which was on rent. so. If I moved to Chandigarh, I, there was no place I could leave my family. My family couldn't come because my children were very small. So Your children were very young at that time, right? Within Mumbai, maybe as they grew up, they were used to the system around. But uh, did they even realize what it was when you're moving into Chandigarh? Did they have any inquisitiveness or any, <laughs> any, any other thoughts? See, when I became a judge, my son was three and a half years old. My daughter was born after I became a And I know. I'll which was a matter of great amusement. because <laughs> and, and among my colleagues, they, in fact, they asked me to host a lunch because <laughs> they said the Some first. Some of them were getting their children <laughs> married, if I'm not yes, wrong. <laughs> yeah, I remember one of them and I told them that, good, nice to know that uh, somebody else has a, you know, young child. And he said, what young child? I said, that one. He said, that's my granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they were very small. So they were not used to all this. And... Then when we went to Ch Chandigarh, uh -huh. they had seen a little bit in Bombay, but not that much. So when they saw all this in Chandigarh, I think my, it was, the children took it in. My son was a little older. My daughter was, a, I think, 11 years old at that stage. And she, I think, in her mind was, that, why is any everybody being so polite to my dad? Yeah. <laughs> So after this, so we stayed at the Raj Bhavan the first night. Then we went and saw the high court. They took us around it. There was an escort around. My colleagues were there. Then the next day was the swearing in ceremony. You were there at it. So there's a lot of uh, formalities. The whole function is yes. very solemn. Yes. With all the dignitaries there. And then there was a dinner. To that only my wife and I were invited. But when I went upstairs to get ready, I think my at that stage, my daughter couldn't take it anymore. So she came upstairs while I was changing and getting ready. And 
And she asked me, said, Dad, are you somebody important or what? <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't get up. Something is wrong yeah, here, yeah. right? Something is wrong here. <laughs> or suddenly he's yeah. getting into a zone. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it's like that. So it, it it was kind of sinking in slowly and then slowly that this uh, he's not as useless as we thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> For a common man, a perception of a judge is very different. Some people think they work very little, they just work five hours and go away home. Some people know how much time they have to spend before and after. So tell us in a judge's life, how do you balance this time management? I know and most uh, other lawyers would know how demanding the job is. The judiciary doesn't end with the high court. right? Remember, the high court has, then, has a supervisory jurisdiction over the entire judiciary of that state. Which means you're dealing with hundreds and many, in many states like in Maharashtra, Punjab and Haryana, thousands of judges. In the lower judiciary. In the lower judiciary. The subordinate judiciary. There's thousands of judges. So the entire machinery has to be looked after. The most important and crucial work is performed by the Chief Justice and his AC, the Administrative Committee, which is in some places the five senior most judges, in some places the six senior most judges, and the smaller courts it'd be only yes, just the few, two judges. Yes, yes. Let me speak about myself. There were areas which I were not, which I was not familiar with. Sadly, for instance, I'm, it's one of my the only regrets that I have during my years as a judge is that I did not get enough exposure to criminal law. Now, there is no problem because the Chief Justice is never alone. He is backed by his colleagues. So, if you trust your colleagues and you respect them, and you must. I was used to lean very heavily on my AC and on my other colleagues. And I was very lucky in Punjab and Haryana because I had a very strong administrative committee at right through those three and a half years. I don't know how would I have functioned without them. Mm -hmm. So the institution has inbuilt support system. Oh, in tremendous support system. Mm -hmm. Tremendous support system. Otherwise, it's very difficult to function. And you find them very dependable also. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was to rely on them. Mm -hmm. And once you trust, you form a committee, obviously it means that you think that you put the best man over there. Then you would leave it to them. If they had an issue, they would come back to the Chief Justice and say, here's an issue. Then there are complaints. Oh my God, there are about 70 to 100 complaints every day. How do you deal with those? Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with oh, those? Oh, I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> So you talked about this um, variety of subjects, like uh, in your case, you said you had very, very little exposure to criminal side as a lawyer. But as we all know that not just criminal side, as a judge, you are dealing from subjects A to Z, while you may have done only B to M as a lawyer. So how do you, how do you tackle each and every alphabet? You need to know your own limitations, intellectually, physically. So if I started thinking that I was a Bhagwati or a Madan, I would, I would be a disaster. So you know your limitations. And you've come up there because the fascination of judgeship is that you're doing, you're going to be given a chance to do subjects which you didn't get a chance to do as a lawyer. So first is know your limitation. Two, never underestimate the contribution that the bar can make and never overestimate as to your own abilities in that regard, even if you're familiar with your subject. Because a counsel reads his beef with a focus which we may not be able to because our numbers are too many. Yes. Right? So, when you're open to being guided by the bar and which you should be, that's the other way of dealing with it. Don't, three, don't get embarrassed to say you don't know. Because if you say, oh yes, I know it, or you feel embarrassed, you know, to admit that you don't know it, then you're you are you're going to be in difficulty. Then when you have reserved judgment, you have a problem. Because it's then you're completely come up front, on your own. Everybody yeah. knows that everybody can't know, doesn't know everything. But even there, see, this is where it's a evolving process. 
I remember my very good friend, Abhay Abhyankar, he, he didn't appear before me. So he came to me once in chambers and said, look, Shavaks, the lawyers on the appellate side have some advice for you. <clears throat> they said, he said that, look, they appreciate your asking for assistance, but don't say too blatantly that, oh, you don't know anything about it. Because there's a litigant behind. And for a litigant, a judge is like God. So he, he, I mean, he hears that, oh, this judge says he doesn't know anything about it. He said, give an indication, yes. a subtle indication to the bar, and they will assist you. Yeah. So, you know, with this kind of input, you yeah, try yeah, and yeah. do the, your the, best. The common man's perception of a judge. Yeah. Yeah. So this, you learn. It's a learning process. The press, the media today, and over the years, more and more so, keeps hinting or talking about uh, interface <coughs> between the executive and the judiciary or uh, sometimes even more brazenly the political interference or maybe no political interference, whichever way you look at it. What is your experience on that? When I was offered judgeship, I, one of the things I did was to go to Justice Sarosh Kapadia, who later became the Chief Justice of India, and I asked him. And you know how Kapadia was. He was very to the point, crisp. He said, you will not face any interference, political interference. That I can guarantee you. So now, you hear all these scary stories. In 17, over 17 years as a judge, his words have come true. Forget any interference. There was not even a hint of an improper request or a suggestion. The politicians I know are from the profession. Yes. Right? For instance, Mr. Kapil Sibyl, Right? I mean, it's not like he wouldn't recognize me. I think he would recognize me even today if he, if I met him outside. Or uh, uh, Dr. Singhvi or Arun Jaitley is one person whom I knew. In fact, he had signed, I think, my warrant. And Arun knew me well enough to make, uh, Arun Jaitley knew me well enough to make even a suggestion, which and nothing would have been, it would be nothing wrong if he did. Not even a whisper from him. So, I've met chief ministers regularly. I mean, in the course of, in, in the Punjab and Haryana, the different chief ministers of Punjab, the same chief minister in Haryana, of course, is still there. Nothing, zero problem. How do your things work in social life, including with your staff, including with co-judges, all, all that? Well, the main thing is there is their reliability. Now, for instance, in, Chand, uh, in Chandigarh, since I was a chief justice, you have a very senior staff with you attached to the Chief Justice's office, which as a, another judge you don't get. So I still call them my Pancharatna, the five of them. And they did everything for me. Oh, the whole family I didn't quite, have to yeah. even look, I didn't have to worry about my family, my friends, my guests, <coughs> anybody. I mean, to such an extent, I mean, really take it to a very high level. I remember one morning, my mother was so ill, her eyes rolled, and we all thought it was a cardiac problem. But never a dull moment over there. I remember there was something very urgent for which I had to, I was meeting my AC early morning. I just didn't know what to do. So I told my mother, I said, I'm sorry, I'm just going to the court and coming back. Now, I was comfortable, but look at the level of comfort she had. She said, in Gujarati, she said, you go, I don't need you. She also had that same oh, yeah, comfort. She said, she said in Gujarati, she said, she said, ja, mani hmm. oh. and around 8 o'clock at night, I suddenly remembered that, God, I have a sick mother. At 8 o'clock at night, but by the time I came back, she was laughing, talking to the staff, everybody. Whether it's a gardener, a sweeper, a senior officer, the chef, cook, anybody. It works both ways, isn't it? No. Without the staff, it is very difficult for a judge to function because how many appointments, how many, you know, it's so difficult to explain to you all as to how much other than your judgment writing is involved in judgment. <laughs> <laughs> when you retired, I couldn't uh, come to Chandigarh. I missed that part, but we were all uh, kind of overwhelmed. I'm saying just by looking at yeah. it. Uh, you are walking out, people from the same level and the level up are throwing rose petals and I haven't seen something like that in Mumbai for sure. Was it really a different experience or very 
emotional kind of thing. Oh, when you after seventeen years, it's always very emotional. But uh, you know, I mean, all I can say is that it is a very they are very generous. I mean, what else can I say? I mean, I don't know why they did it, but they are extremely generous. Did you expect yeah. something like that, uh, or was it no, uh, something not like I was an no. exception? They have done it to many others. They have done it to many others. They are a, they are a very generous lot. Sometimes uh, a lot of people are very unfair when they say that. Uh, it there's a lot of people would say that to me when in Bombay High Court. Oh, everybody is polite to you because you're a judge. Oh, everybody is polite to you because you're Chief Justice. I think today the same people realize how wrong they were. Yeah. It's now five and a half years since I've retired. They don't even have to look at my face because after retirement, you're a nobody. As my family tells me, now you're finished. <laughs> you're <nobody. laughs> even today, after five and a half years, uh -huh. they don't make you feel like you've retired. There is not a day when I don't get some message from somebody in the staff or my colleagues or something. They never make you feel like you're a nobody. They still help you. They still assist you. You almost, you know, sometimes you have to sort of shake yourself up and say, look, this is not... Uh... And they would always say, no, this is our duty. And I keep telling them, look, Maybe while I was in office, uh, after retirement, it's not your duty, it's your mehrbani. <laughs> so please tell us, how is it to be a retired man, but not a retired man? Certainly not as busy as you are when you are a judge. There's no comparison. It's very different, uh, Pradeep. You're back in private practice. If you're asking me, yeah, I miss my judgeship a lot. Judgeship, your colleagues, your staff... I remember when I left the Bombay High Court, when I was at that farewell, it suddenly struck me that, oh my God, I'll never be able to enter this building again, the way I used to earlier. And that hit me very badly. So when I went to the Punjab and Haryana High Court, it's a beautiful High Court. And I enjoyed every single moment over there because I knew that, gosh, when it... But as you know, I was, uh, before I, just before I retired, I was... Uh, feeling very nostalgic. And I told one of my colleagues, Justice Arun Palli, I said, Arun, I'm going to miss this place and all of you. He said, don't worry, Chief. You will never miss it. I said, why? He said, because now all our children are in the pipeline hmm. to get married and you'll have to keep coming back. For every <laughs> so we'll not let and you miss it. That's what, thank God, it's been so. And I, it's always lovely going and, you know, going back to your colleagues from Bombay, from Punjab and Haryana, from Delhi. It's so nice to go back and be with everybody all the time. So it's a family that never breaks up. And one last thing, just as Rajivdar, before we uh, we come to close. Uh, I want you to share some thoughts for the law students or for budding lawyers or for young lawyers. What is the message or what is the thought that you want to share with them? Two things. When you come up, don't think you're doing anybody a favor. Yes, that's your choice. It's your choice. Don't think, I mean, don't have that. Otherwise, you'll, you'll develop an attitude. You're doing it for yourself. Whether what you do has contributed to society or not is for others to judge. Do it because you enjoy it. True, true, true. So don't have this great feeling about yourself that you're doing society a favor. You're not. And if it is, it's incidental. That somebody else will decide. The other thing is, when you become a judge, in your mind, you should say to yourself that I'm happy and proud to remain a judge of my court and whichever that court is and to retire as a judge. Don't even think of the future. Don't, and I mean this very, very seriously. Don't say that, oh, I will become a chief justice. I will go to the Supreme Court. I will become the CJ. Don't not, do that. Not everyone can have that, yes. Don't, because then you're joining for the wrong reason. If you allow me what you just said, I'd like to sum it up this way. As a judge, you are advocating that when given a chance, the advocate must give up that position and become a judge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
thank you very much, Justice Wasifdar. It is really nice talking to you. No. And it's really nice connecting in this manner at this uh, platform after having been together in many different ways over the last se- Thank you, several decades. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my views. I know there's a lot that I have not said. That's out of choice, but it has been a great experience for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you once again. The life of a judge is so much more than passing orders and judgments. Thank you, Justice Vajivdar, for sharing your experience with us. You just watched an episode of the Bombay Bar Association podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more such videos. We also have an audio podcast which dives a bit deeper and is available on all podcast apps.